All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Today, we have David Packals with us. So welcome to the show, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Of course. Grateful to have you here. Um, so yeah, if you can just start us off a little bit more about you and what you got going on. Well, uh, I think most people know me. I guess my claim to fame is that uh, is that there was a movie made about a certain part of my life called War Dogs. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, I had gotten into uh, uh, dealing uh, weapons and ammunition to the U.S. government primarily. So uh, they called us the uh, stoner arms dealers in the media because we were so young and, you know, uh, we won a massive $300 million contract, one of the biggest small arms contracts ever uh, awarded by the U.S. government to arm the entire country of Afghanistan, of the, the army and police force of Afghanistan. And um, the shenanigans that occurred with that is uh, what made it into the movie. Uh, currently, I am uh, working. I uh, have uh, taken a little detour in my career. <laughs> and I'm uh, currently uh, uh, the CEO of Singular Sound, which is a music tech company. We produce uh, products for musicians like a hands-free drum machine, the world's most advanced loop pedal, and things of that nature. And I am also a partner with my brother on another venture that we just launched called InstaFloss, which is a new device that we designed together that can floss all of your teeth for you in 10 seconds. So wow. yeah, you can check it out at instafloss.com, like Instagram, but flossing. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Okay. Yeah. I want to talk about everything. That's all. So, yeah. Um, it seems so being entrepreneurial, it seems, is that always kind of been in your blood? Like, cause it just mm -hmm. seems like your first go at it was just maybe a little bit outside of the law, but then, you know, <laughs> it's always been entrepreneurial, I guess is the question. Is that yeah. Right? Well, my first, uh, my first uh, entrepreneurial venture was actually when I was six years old. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, it was, uh, I was living in Israel at the time. Um, and uh my, we were living in an old apartment building that didn't have a garbage chute and it didn't have an elevator either. So anytime you wanted to take the trash out, you'd need to take the trash out, you know, down the stairs uh, to the dumpster on the corner. And my mom asked me and my older sister, who's like a year and a half older than me, she was about seven and change uh, to take the trash out. And we were complaining because we were playing with Legos and we didn't want to take the trash out. And and she was getting annoyed with us. And then my dad walks by and he's like, oh, you guys are looking all, at this all wrong. You know, you think this is a, a chore, but really this is an opportunity because all of our neighbors, they don't like taking the trash out either. So you can start a service where you can go to them and charge them some money. And, you know, they don't have to take the trash out every day. So maybe every other day you take their trash out and you can charge them, I don't know, maybe be like a quarter a week or something for taking the trash out three times a week. And we thought, well, that's a great idea. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you should go talk to the neighbors, but first practice and go take your mother's trash out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, and so we went to all the neighbors and we, uh, we told, we offered our service and we got eight neighbors to sign up to our service. And um, at the end of the week, uh, we were small, so we had we put all the trash in this like uh, metal cart uh, that was on wheels that our mother had, and we take it down the stairs, you know, going ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk down the stairs to the dumpster, and then we together have to haul it over the dumpster. Um, and uh, at the end of the week, we complained to our dad. We're like, you know, this is this is way too much work. Be you know, it's not really worth a quarter a week. Uh, and he said, well, what if you were making twice as much money? Would you do it then? And we were like, well, maybe for 50 cents a week, that's worth it. And he's like, well, then just tell uh, the neighbors that you're raising the price. And we said, well, we can't do that. We just literally a week ago, we said it was a quarter a week. And he said, well, if you don't raise the price, you're going to quit anyway. So why don't you, so either they are willing to pay it or you're not going to do it. So you might as well make them the offer and see if they take it. And so we went to all the neighbors and we're like, we're raising the price to 50 cents a week. And most of them just said, yeah, no problem. 50 cents. Good deal. Um, uh, one neighbor quit. And from then on, we saw their own daughter take out the trash, which we'd never seen before. I guess they realized, why are we paying the neighbor's kids for this when we have a perfectly healthy kid of our own? <laughs> and um, and yeah. another neighbor 
complained he in classic israeli fashion he's like why you raise the price you can't just double the price this is crazy this week maybe you put it up five cents next week maybe ten cents double this is crazy and uh we're like well we, we stuck to our guns and we're like uh well we're that's the new price and he's like okay fine 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 and he he paid us the the price and then after a few weeks my sister just decided she didn't want to do it and i realized hey i'm making double again and so i kept on doing it for a few months and built up quite a quite a few quarters it was shekels in israel uh, in a little ziploc bag um, and every day the, uh, the ice cream truck would come by singing this little ice cream song. And I would think to myself, you know, I've got money. I could buy myself an ice cream and cause my parents would never buy me ice cream, you know, unless it was like a special occasion. And, um, and so I'd go into my, into my Ziploc bag with all my shekels and take out a few coins and go buy myself an ice cream. And after like a couple of months, I had a, 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 a aunt visit me from the United States and she looked at me and she's like, huh, you're getting, gaining a little bit of weight. <laughs> Cause I was, uh, eating, I was eating way too much ice cream. And so that business uh, ended up ending because I turned seven years old and I, my dad got me a, a, like a little styrofoam airplane for my birthday where you would wind up the propeller. It was powered by a rubber band and then you could throw it and the propeller would spin and it would fly. And my older brother wanted to play with it. He's three years older than me. So he was 10. And I told him you could play with it, but if you break it, you're going to owe me a new one. And he's like, I promise I, if I break it, I'll owe you a new one. And of course, on the first throw, he it breaks. It was a styrofoam yeah. piece of garbage, yeah. you know? That, <laughs> and of course, he had no way to, he didn't have any money. So my dad said, well, why don't you take over his job? And you could earn the money that way. And it took him like a good month and a half to earn the money back to pay me uh, for a new airplane. And at that point, I was just used to, I, I don't even think I ended up buying a new airplane. I just ended up buying ice cream instead. And <laughs> at that point, I was just used to not working and getting the money. Uh, um, and uh, so I just didn't want to continue the job. And I had already had a bunch saved up. So I figured in my six-year-old, seven at that time, year old mind, I realized, you know, hey, this this is going to, this ice cream money is going to last me a while. I don't really feel like doing the work. So I never went back yeah. to it. And that's, it's so that was, so that's the story of my first entrepreneurial venture. I love that. And it's so, it's so interesting to me too, where it's like, when, as you get older and you make more money and stuff, it's not necessarily the most money where you feel the richest. Like mm -hmm. you may have felt the richest at six, seven years old, just yeah. in comparison, you, you went from exactly. maybe five ice creams a year to five <laughs> a day or something. I mean, exactly. yeah, exactly. five you know, a like, week, but yes. Yeah. Five a week. Yeah. And it's like yeah. that. Yeah. You you had no worries in the world. You you could get everything you wanted. The ice cream exactly. Itself. It's just exactly. funny. It's not yeah. always more money that makes it, it feel the richest, but it's all uh, relative. Absolutely. All relative. Yeah. yeah. Um, got it. And then uh, between, I guess, let's go and uh, I guess just uh, not logical, but uh, what do you even call it? Sorry, it's later. Chronological. In the yeah, that is the one I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. before uh, the movie stuff, because I like I, I think I told you before the recording, I've seen the movie like five times. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite movies. But before you got involved in that, were there any other entrepreneurial adventures or adventures? Yeah. Um, so when I was uh, I mean, there this, this is a relatively short podcast, so I won't go into into all of them. But um, but before before uh, I got into the uh, to the arms business, which the movie was made about, um, I was um, I was let's see, I was about 20. So when I got into that business, I was about 22. I was uh, in college studying chemistry and I. Um, I had uh, a friend of mine uh, told had gotten into business supplying nursing homes. And um, actually before, let me back up before that, the way I got into that um, at the time there were uh, digital cameras were becoming a real big thing. And so I bought myself a digital camera and I realized that the SD card, if you wanted to have a high quality, you know, high memory level SD card was almost as expensive as the camera itself. And so I was looking for a better deal on SD cards. And eventually I found a better deal, but only if you bought like 50 of them. So I realized, hey, I could, uh, deal's pretty good. 
on eBay, they're selling for more than I'm paying. So I could just buy the 50, keep one for myself and sell the rest on eBay. And they sold very quickly and they were very easy to deal with because they're tiny. You could just mail it, you know, in a in an envelope. And so I started selling SD cards online, expanding that into different uh, types of memory chips and things like that. Started doing pretty well. And then I talked to a friend of mine and he yeah, I told him about the business I was doing. And he's like, oh, you, you know, you have some experience in searching for sources internationally and importing. I'm actually uh, dealing with bed sheets and linens, uh, selling it to nursing homes in the United States. And I buy from distributors who are who are importing it. If you could get a better deal, I'll buy my bed sheets and linens from you. And so I said, okay. And I looked online for manufacturers, eventually found uh, some good quality manufacturers with good look with low prices um, out of Pakistan of all places and started importing bed sheets and uh, towels and various other stuff for nursing homes, like uh, patient gowns and things like that. Uh, started selling it to him and started selling it to other things that made it into the, into the movie. I was gonna say, uh, I think yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in the movie, they show me as going door to door in, in these like uh, assisted living facilities um, uh, where I'm like trying to sell it to each individual owner that's not how it was really i was just doing brokering I, I never even took possession of the goods really i would just do it in bulk and ship it to a warehouse and i wouldn't even buy it before i already had a, a buyer lined up on my end so i was just uh so i never got stuck with a whole bunch of bed sheets like they show in the movie but uh the, the movie wanted to make me look a lot more down on my luck in the beginning so that the the dramatic arc of the success from the arms deal would be be more dramatic um yeah. you know that's why they make it look like my life has completely fallen apart in the beginning and then i you know get into this whole thing and live in the high life until it all comes crashing down makes a good hollywood story um in, in reality i wasn't doing so badly i wasn't doing great or anything like that I was, but you know i was doing okay um and um and while i was doing that is when i bumped into my former friend Ephraim Divaroli, uh, who is played by Jonah Hill in the film. Uh, and he asked me, oh, what are you doing these days? And I told him about my businesses. And he was like, hey, you know, that's actually a lot of similarities to what I do. I look for suppliers internationally and I uh, arrange logistics and work on the uh, the licensing and the financing and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I but I bet I'm making way more money than you. So why don't you come and uh, work with me? I could use a good partner who I can trust and is smart and works hard. And uh, I've been looking, you know, for a partner, and uh, I think we could make a lot more money together than either of us could make on our own. And yeah. so I told him, well, uh, how much money have you made? And he goes to me, he's like, okay, I'm going to tell you, but only to inspire you. Okay, I'm not bragging. Right. And uh, he was four years younger than me. So he was 18 years old at the time. Oh, and, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. In the movie, they say we're the same age. He's actually four years younger than me. I was 22. He was 18. And so he logs into his laptop and he goes into uh, his Bank of America account and he shows me and he has $1.8 million in his bank account. And, yeah. and I knew, I know his family, I grew up with him and uh, I knew that his parents didn't give him that money. So he definitely had earned it and he'd only been working on his own independently for about a year. Um, he had learned the business from his uncle in LA uh, when he was 16, he got kicked out of uh, high school for smoking weed and they sent him to his uncle to work for his uncle uh, to teach him a lesson about, you know, taking life seriously. And he got obsessed with guns and learned how to bid on government contracts uh, from his uncle. And then they had a falling out. He moved back to Miami when he was like 17 and change and uh, worked on his own for about a year. Um, until like we bumped into each other and that's, uh, and I was like, it, that blew me away. I'm like an 18 year old kid who has $1.8 million in the bank. I was only been working at this for a year that, I mean, I wasn't doing so badly, but that was way, way, way better than I, than I had <laughs> yeah. my, the more money than I was making. And so I was like, okay, I'm in, you know, teach me what you know. Uh, and that's how we started working together. 
Got it. Okay. So let me, um, yeah, let's go through this. I, and obviously I bet every podcaster is curious, right? So just yeah. be curious of the differences in the movie and what happened in reality, but mm -hmm. I guess, um, cause I do want to make sure, uh, that I want to talk about what you got going on now, but so in the, in this whole situation, I guess there's a few questions. One is like, um, you know, so you start working with him and then you start making some good money. And I just rewatched the trailer actually, before we hopped on this, what was that, that one big deal where you're at the table and then they ask you, or they tell you that you were 50 million below yeah. the, so what, what basically you guys won the deal because you were so much lower, but the reason mm -hmm. Jonah Hill was pissed is because you basically could have made an extra like 48 million or something. Let's yes, say. exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's yeah. That was the Afghan deal uh, that it was in total, it was worth $300 million and we were about 50 million lower than the next competitor. Yeah. And so it, we could have made an extra, you know, almost $50 million and still won the contract. Of course, we didn't know that because the way the government works is they ask you for your best price and they don't tell you what everyone else is bidding. And then whoever has the lowest price combined with some other factors like who they think could actually uh, realistically deliver and, and you know, how trustworthy they are, their back, their, their past performance, they call it. Um, then they yeah. award, they award that to the uh, you know, to whoever they, they, feel overall provides the best value to the government and then you deliver and they pay you and hopefully you worked in a profit margin for yourself so you actually make some money got yeah. it and what uh like in the beginning was everything legal like what about it became mm -hmm. illegal? I, I right guess, yeah. right so as they say it was completely legal until it wasn't right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um so what uh, it was completely legal. What happened was when, um, so this, this contract, the $300 million contract uh, was uh, with the United States army with the U S army was the agency that was paying us, but they were providing the ammo to the Afghan national army who were, who were our, um, our uh, allies at the time they were fighting the Taliban uh, alongside us in Afghanistan. And, um, and so uh, uh, in our contract with the U.S. Army, it said no Chinese ammunition could be delivered uh, under this contract. Yeah. Uh, and the reason it said that was because there is there is an arms embargo placed against China uh, that was placed against China in 1989 after the Tiananmen Square massacre, uh, where famously uh, thousands of Chinese university students were protesting for democracy and for human rights. And the Chinese military came in and like more or less killed them all. Um, and yeah, there's a very famous picture called Tank Man where like a line of tanks and there's like a single Chinese man standing in front of them um, that came out of that. And so because of that, that became worldwide news, a huge scandal. The United States put China on a, um, uh, a, a military um uh, you know, you cannot transact with them list. Uh, so there was an embargo against them. So, um, but that wasn't your fault, was it? Like no, that, no. So no, I mean, Brad, Bradley Cooper, you right. guys know it was that ammunition. Right. So what happened was we made a deal with, um, with a arms broker named Henry Tomei, um, who is in the movie is played by Bradley Cooper yeah. And he arranged this deal for us to get a bunch of ammo for the AK-47 uh, out of Albania. And Albania, for those who don't know, is a tiny little country near Greece. Um, and uh, they had gotten, so we, we didn't know anything about the history of Albania at the time. But when we went over there to inspect the ammo, we found that all the ammo had Chinese markings on the boxes uh, because they had originally gotten that ammunition from China in the seventies when they, the, there's an interesting history there, but they were, used to be allies, Albania and China. Okay. Uh, now we didn't know that until we went over there to inspect the ammo. Um, and at that point, by the time we went to inspect the ammo, it had already been like a few months into the contract. We had already arranged all the licensing, the export permit, the import permit, the flyover permits, where you because we we're flying everything into Afghanistan. Whenever you fly anything uh, over any military equipment over another country, you have to get every country a flyover permission from them 
to fly wow. that stuff over. And it's very, it was very difficult to get because some of those countries were not friendly to the United States. So it took us a few months. Um, so uh, we had already arranged everything. And then we were like, you know what, we're going to do a last minute inspection here just to make sure everything's good. And that's when we discover that the the stuff was all Chinese. Now, and the, the army was pressuring us, deliver, deliver, deliver as quickly as you can, because it was turning into springtime, which is the fighting season in Afghanistan. They don't, they, they can't fight during the winter because the snow, the mountains are very high and the snow is very deep. And so you can't really go through the trails, you know, to go and fight your enemy. So they only, they have a fighting season, which is the spring and summertime. Um, and it was the snows were melting and fighting was starting and, and our Afghan allies were running out of ammo. And so the army was yelling at us, hurry up with the deliveries. And if we had were going to change sources, it would have taken us another few months. So at that point, we realized, well, we have uh, two choices. We could either go to the army and say, hey, guys, you know, we uh, we kind of messed up. We know that our contract says no Chinese ammo, but you know this am. But we know that you meant to put that in there because of the arms embargo against China. But this ammo was given to Albania in the seventies before there was an arms embargo, so it's technically doesn't violate the arms embargo. But wow. because you guys didn't mention this issue in the arms embargo in the contract, it just says no Chinese ammo. Period. So therefore, this ammo violates the terms of our contract. So can you give us a, a you know a signed waiver that allows us to deliver this ammo? It doesn't violate the embargo. No harm, no foul, right? Um, mm -hmm. So they could have said, yeah, sure, no problem. We really need the ammo as quickly as possible. Here's a, here's a waiver. Go ahead. Uh, here's an amendment to the contract. Or they could have, and this is what we were afraid of, said something along the lines of, yeah, it doesn't violate the embargo. You're right. But all your uh, competitors had to bid on this contract on the condition that there was no Chinese ammo, period. And so it's not fair to your competitors to change the contract now. So we're going to have to take this $300 million contract away from you and put it out for open bid again. And so you guys could bid it again. Good luck. And we did not want that. And so we're like, you know, should we tell them? Should we risk losing the contract? Maybe we shouldn't tell them. And that's <laughs> where that was the big mistake that we made is that we decided not to not only not tell them, but to hire someone to cover it up. So we hired someone to repackage the ammunition into these cardboard boxes so we could remove all the Chinese markings from the boxes and, um, and disguise that it was originally Chinese. And it, we were delivering that stuff and everything was going great and the army was happy with the ammo. They were thrilled. And then Ephraim, of course, wanted to make more money on the deal, as he always did. So he tried to uh, get he got rid of the guy who was doing the repackaging operation for us and got someone cheaper instead. And the guy he got rid of ended up stuck with about $20,000 worth of cardboard boxes that he could do nothing with. And he asked to be paid for that. And Ephraim never paid him because he just didn't want to. And so that guy got really pissed and he told the New York Times about what we were doing and he told the FBI about what we were doing and oh. his and they started investigations and uh his big mistake was that he told the Albanian press, the local Albanian press about you know the deal and he also told them that the local politicians were getting kickbacks from the deal which could have been true and probably was true, but it wasn't coming from us because that would have been illegal for us to do. We were our contract was with the Swiss arms broker uh, Henry um, Bradley Cooper, right? <laughs> but uh, and we assume he was paying, you know, kickbacks, but he you know, obviously didn't tell us about it. But um, because he said that, we assume uh, a few weeks later uh, he ended up dead. Uh, he got into a very mysterious car crash in the middle of nowhere where, with no other cars on the road. And he was thrown from his car like 30 feet and they found him dead next to his car. So uh, we assumed that like, you know, the local power brokers uh, weren't happy about him talking to the press and, and uh, took him out. Um, but because of that, so, so the, uh, so at that time, everything was kind of going smoothly for, for the contract. 
And Ephraim decided that he didn't really want to pay me any money um, because he felt I didn't deserve it. And so I told him, well, I'll see you in court, motherfucker. Fuck you, you know, and (laughs) and I quit and I was getting ready to sue him. And then uh, like a month and a half or so after I, I, I quit, I heard that the federal federal agents raided his office and took all his documents and um eventually i found they told the federal agents told me um uh later on when you know after i i had pled guilty to my part in it uh they told me they found a to-do list on ephraim's desk and one of the items in the to-do list in his handwriting was repackaged chinese ammo (laughs) so so yeah so they had a lot of evidence that about the about the scheme to repackage the ammo uh not only did they find his handwritten note but they also found emails between us and between the people doing the repackaging note to any uh any uh people considering committing crimes don't put it in an email emails <laughs> emails and text messages live forever and that's how they always get you in court so but at the time we were super stressed out. We were working 18 hour days, very low on sleep and a lot of different time zones. And so instead of waiting a few hours on very low sleep to, for someone to wake up and tell them to do something, we're like, oh, I'm just going to write this in an email. And that's how it, that incriminating stuff ended up in, in the emails that, that uh, was our downfall. So I pled guilty because there was email evidence for of my involvement. There was no, uh, and anyway, even if I didn't, even if I wanted to plead innocent, I didn't, uh, I was completely broke because Ephraim, you know, didn't pay me a penny and you need a few hundred thousand dollars to fight the feds in court with a decent lawyer. So yeah. it wasn't really an option. So I pled guilty. Ephraim fought them for about two years, but ended up pleading guilty too. Um, I ended up getting sentenced to seven months of house arrest, which you know, extremely lucky, very fortunate. I wow. avoided avoided jail time completely. Uh, he probably could have gotten something similar, um, but he uh, committed a second crime before he was sentenced for the first one. So he invalidated his plea agreement. And so he got caught up in a, what happened was he, um, they, after he pled guilty, they said, you know, the way it works is you sign a plea agreement with the prosecutors saying that you admit your wrongdoing. And the prosecutors say, well, for admitting your wrongdoing and saving us the time and money and effort of going, taking you to court, we're going to recommend to the judge that the judge gives you the minimum. And however, you know, you can't commit any further crimes uh, before the judge sentences you, because how are we going to tell the judge that, you know, you, you regret your wrongdoing and you're going to be a good citizen from now on if you commit a second crime. So they told Ephraim, stay out of the, uh, just stay out of the arms business. And you had, he had to stay in Miami because he was out on bond. Right. Um, and of course he didn't stay out of the arms business. He kept on doing it through like a friend of his, an intermediary. And uh, through his friend, he got caught up in a sting operation by the ATF where they, an undercover ATF agent said, yeah, we could do this deal, but you have to come meet me in Orlando, which he was not allowed to travel to, you know, cause he had to stay in Miami. And so he travels to Orlando, the ATF, the undercover ATF agent says, Hey, you know, I just bought this, the latest uh, HK handgun. You know, this thing's so cool. Look at this because he knew Ephraim was a gun nut and Ephraim picks up the gun and he's like, Oh, I heard about this thing. I wanted to shoot it. Let's go to the range and pop off a few rounds. What can I say? once a gun runner always a gun runner am i right <laughs> and and then the, oh the the undercover agent slaps the cuffs on him and says you're under arrest you're a felon in possession of a firearm wow <laughs> and, yeah, because because he had already pled guilty to the uh, to the fraud charge, so he was already a, technically a felon, and yeah. um and and if you are if you're in possession of a firearm as a felon, you can get up to ten years in prison. So and he could have gotten five years for the for the fraud charge, where you know for the uh, changing the Chinese ammo. Um, yeah. So he could have he could have gotten fifteen years total. Um, but he hired the best lawyers in Miami, spent millions of dollars on them, negotiated it down to four. He ended up getting out in like three and a half on good behavior. And now he's out and about in Miami. Um, 
And from what I've heard these days, he is in the business of funding lawsuits because he's been uh, sued so many times and he's sued other people so many times that he's very familiar with how lawsuits work. And so if someone wants to sue somebody and they don't have the money to sue them, he will go in there and fund the legal costs for suing them and probably take the vast majority of the money as well, is what I'm assuming, um, <laughs> yeah. if, if not all of it, the way he works. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, uh, so I haven't talked to him in years. Um, we ended up settling for, for the money he owed me for a tiny fraction of what he owed me just because I wanted to get him out of my life and move on with my life. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one good thing that came out of it is I, uh, while I was under house arrest, I got the idea for my current business, uh, Singular Sound, which yeah. so, yeah. So the way the way that worked was while I was under house arrest, uh, and it wasn't so bad. I mean, house arrest. It's it wasn't like a like a COVID lockdown where you where nobody could visit you and you know you're by yourself for like months and months on end. Um, it was I had an ankle tracking thing, you know, or so uh, that you can't take off. Um, but my friends could visit me, uh, so it wasn't so bad. And so I'd have my, you know, I've been playing guitar since I was 15. And so I'd have my musician friends visit me and we'd jam. But of course, no drummer was going to bring his entire drum set over. So I really missed playing with a drummer. Um, and so I bought a, uh, a drum machine, which is a electronic tabletop device that uh, you could make. It has a bunch of buttons on it. You can make beats on it by pressing the different buttons and then it plays the beat in a loop. Um, but the problem with the drum machine, you know, so I was using that to play along to, but every time I wanted to change the beat, like to go from verse to chorus or throw in a drum fill or something, I had to stop playing my guitar, press a button on the machine and go pack back to playing my guitar and it interrupted the flow of the music. It was very annoying. So I realized I need a drum machine that's hands-free, that's controllable like by your foot. So I don't have to interrupt my guitar playing. So I went online to look for like a drum machine inside a guitar pedal. That was the idea. And I couldn't find it. I asked my musician friends if they'd seen anything like it. They said, no, but let me know if you find it. Cause that sounds super cool. I want one too. And I realized nobody's making this. Everybody wants it. So I created it. It's called the Beat Buddy for people who are watching this on video. You see, it's, there's a poster wow. right there. It's called the Beat Buddy. Gizmodo called it a genius idea, right? They said, <laughs> <laughs> they said it, not me. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, and you can control a drum beat hands-free while you play your guitar. So if you tap the pedal, it does a drum fill. If you hold it down, it does a transition. When you let go, it goes to a different beat. You could put your own beats in there. Uh, you could create beats on like musical software and put it in there. You could create your own drum sets. Uh, so there's a huge amount of... Uh, a huge amount of uh, um, uh, capabilities that you have with this, so it became a huge hit. Um, I did. I raised. I did. I was completely broke at the time because I spent all my money on lawyers to keep me out of prison. Uh, so I um, uh, did a crowdfunding campaign for it. It did yeah. extremely well. Uh, raised three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in a month, and that was a, uh, enough to do the manufacturing and and launch my company and. Since then, I've come out with uh, an additional uh, five music-related products, uh, all for musicians, and just recently uh, launched our first uh, non-music-related product, which is the InstaFloss, the device that flosses all your teeth for you effortlessly in 10 seconds. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And you can yeah, check it out, in InstaFloss.com. I highly recommend everyone check it out. And you yeah, can buy no. you can buy one now. <laughs> I'm gonna check it out for sure, dude. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I think both you you know, you're you're just like a very good problem solver. I mean, and yeah. I guess that's Thank what you. entrepreneurs are at the end of the day. But mm. um, no, dude, flossing is something nobody likes to floss. Exactly. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah, I yeah. always have intentions of doing it, and then I'm like, oh, I don't feel like doing it. Yeah, this. it's a pain in the butt. Yeah, I think I can handle that. Yeah, exactly. That's and that's how I came up with the idea. I was uh, hanging out with my brother and we had just eaten some mango and gotten like the fibers stuck in our teeth. And we were, you know, getting rid of it with uh, dental floss. And we were thinking, uh, you know, we're it, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> I love mango. And uh, yeah, and we were, we were thinking, you know, we were saying, you know, like we're in the music business, but only like 
at most 10% of people are musicians and maybe 10% of those buy like professional quality gear of, you know, the high level stuff we make. So uh, we have like an addressable market of maybe 1% of the population. I mean, we've done very well and I'm not complaining. Uh, we've won a whole bunch of awards. I've got to meet my musical idols, you know, like famous musicians that I grew up listening to their music and now they use my products. It's super cool. Um, yeah. but, um, uh, but you know we were we were always thinking about products or or service or something that anyone could use because it, the market is just so much bigger. And so while we're flossing our teeth, we're like, you know, flossing is such a pain in the butt. If we could make flossing easier, that everyone would want that. And so we started brainstorming of different ways of uh, you could ways you can make flossing easier. Eventually, we came up with the uh, Insta Floss design, which uses twelve water jets to floss the entire uh, all four quadrants of your teeth, and all you have to do is uh, slide it across your teeth, and it gives you a, a perfect floss every time. Dude, that's so sick! Yeah. Uh all right. A couple uh, quick questions. And I, I can be a few minutes late to my next thing. I yeah. want to make sure because I don't want to rush this. This is an awesome interview, man. Um, so one question uh, is, so for the Insta Floss, I'm just yeah. curious, like, so far, and maybe it's super new, I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. uh, what has been your marketing strategy for it? Or do you have like an outline strategy or, because I think yeah. word of mouth will take over eventually, but yeah. Um, what, what have you thought about doing marketing so far for it? Right. So part of our marketing is for me to go on podcasts and talk about it. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> luckily, luckily, yeah. luckily, I've uh, been blessed with this awesome story, which gets me onto podcasts. Uh, so using that as like a, you know, a hook, but, um, but we also, my brother's also doing podcasts. Who's my partner. He's the CEO of InstaFloss. I'm the, I, I remain the CEO of uh, Singular Sound, which is our music company. And so he's been doing podcasts, which is more focused on the business and the dental aspects of it. Uh, so he's been doing like dental focused podcasts and business focused podcasts. And, um, uh, but we have a, we have a, a online marketing um uh, strategy where we're using all the the usual stuff like uh, influencers and yeah, and yeah and uh, and online advertising. Um, currently, our focus is to sell it to direct to consumer for the first year um, because, well, obviously, we make a lot more profit that way than selling to Walmart. And we also get the the direct interaction with our customers. So if there's any issues with it, we could take care of it immediately. We don't have to get a whole bunch of returns from Walmart and, and like get no feedback from the customers. So we're doing direct to consumers so we can have immediate feedback as well as capture more of the profits. And then in about a year, our, we literally just delivered uh, the first few hundred units to customers a few weeks ago. Oh. So yeah, so this has literally just happened. Um, very good response so far. We've had a few issues that we had to take care of, but we took care of them. Uh, as with any new product, I've meant this is gonna this is my eighth product that I've manufactured at this point, and every single product has a few problems in the first production run. So there's you know nothing, no no huge deal breakers there. But um, so we're going to be selling direct to consumer for the first year through our website instafloss.com, uh, and then we will move to retailers and to dental offices. So that's uh, that's our strategy. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, after we stop recording, I want to share something with you then about yeah. that. I have an idea for you. Sure. Um, so, um, oh, I had one more here. Maybe it'll come to me before I ask the next question. Is um, uh, what do you think? A two part question on the war dog stuff, and then we can yeah. put it away. Um, with I guess we'll call him your old friend. Um, what do you think it was like? Do you think it was just greed? Like, is that just what it came down to? Just greed? Is you is, mean like why did it fail? Yeah, or like why? Like, because it was. It's like he was already making mm. a good amount of money. Like, I just right. don't, when people, I just never understand that stuff. So I guess it's just right. like or greed is that kind of what you yes to? yes i 100 percent attribute it to greed and yeah. uh the truth is is that i should have seen it coming right because i saw how he acted with other people i mean just to give you the kind of mindset he's a very um special person i guess you know to to <laughs> to, 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 to be nice about it um 
And, and, you know, there is advantages to his specialness as well as disadvantages. Uh, it was a, a big part of why he succeeded so early in life was because of the way he was, but also a big part of why he failed was also. So one thing that he was very good at was working very hard. He was a obsessive uh, workaholic, worked 18 hour days on a regular basis. And, and so did I when I was working with him. Um, and he was also extremely good at negotiating. Like he could really, I mean, I've seen him wipe the floors with like, you know, 50 year old executives from major corporations in negotiations, you know, just like wipe the floor with them. And he was like 18, 19 years old. He was just much better at negotiating with them. And, um, and, uh, uh, but he, and I think one of the reasons he was so motivated was because, um, it wasn't really necessarily about the money, right? So I saw him once be on the phone with, I think it was AT&T for like 45 minutes, bitching and screaming because he felt like he was overcharged five bucks on his bill. And <laughs> and I told him, I'm like, you know, after he finally got them to remove the $5 extra charge, I'm like, Ephraim, why are you spending all this time you know, about this $5 charge, you know, you'll make more money just working on another contract. And he goes to me, he's like, nobody fucks me, nobody. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, he does, he fucks other people, but nobody fucks him. Again, you know, he's <laughs> like, it's a matter of principle, you know? And so I was like, okay. And I'd also seen him like completely destroy someone, uh, someone's business uh, to, in order to make like an extra 2% profit. You know, something that would have not moved the needle for him at all. He completely destroyed this guy's business. He did some like tricky business maneuver. It wasn't illegal, but it was definitely unethical. And he completely screwed this guy over, put him in a really bad situation. And and Ephraim made just a tiny bit more money, like an extra 2% of what he was going to make. And I, I told him, like, why are you like, you know, why are you doing this to this guy? And he's like, it's like, it's all money, man. It's all money. You know, um, one, one thing I actually heard is just really uh, uh, encapsulates uh, Ephraim's personality is uh, I, I ended up. So Ephraim, while he was in prison, had a, a wrote a book. I should say he had a book ghost written for him. Um, it, and he, his book, uh, called once a gun runner, right. After the famous line, he told the undercover ATF agent, uh, <laughs> uh, his book, uh, was written by one of his fellow inmates named Matt Cox, who was in prison for real estate fraud. And, uh, Matt actually, when, of course, Matt got out of prison, uh, as well as Ephraim and they published the book and in true classic form, Ephraim screwed Matt out of all the money that he promised him for the book. Right. Mm -hmm. And so Matt called me up and, you know, he was getting ready to sue Ephraim as everyone else does. Right. And he called me up just to ask me for my advice and dealing with him. And, uh, and so I talked to Matt for a bit and he told me a story, you know, that like while he was writing this book for Ephraim in prison, uh, he, you know, and Ephraim was telling him all these stories about all these people he screwed over, you know, and all these, you know, yeah, and he said, you know, that Matt told him, he's like, Ephraim, you can't keep on burning all your bridges. And Ephraim looked at him and said, there's lots of bridges out there, man. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Dude, it is like, yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. like not funny, but it's a little funny. No, I mean it's it's hilarious if it's not if it's not you're if you're not the bridge he's burning. Yeah, you know? yeah. So yeah, I mean he's so just crazy. he's just that kind of person, you know, like that's that's just how he operates and who he is. Yeah. And so yeah, I mean, it was absolutely greed. It wasn't just me, it was everyone. Even like the person he replaced me with after I quit also sued him. The person he replaced that guy with sued him. Like literally that that was like just how he worked he would get people he would promise them the world make them a deal and then screw them over when it came time to pay and that's and he just managed to do this very very well yeah so crazy um okay so last two questions i have is um the last one on the war dog stuff is just like what were you know when you knew mm -hmm. that were not going to pan out uh, favorably like or maybe before your sentencing like in the movie i think you're you know you're in this like penthouse in miami and stuff and i, I think yeah you have like a wife and children I yeah think. i have a daughter yeah 
daughter. Yeah, my, yeah. 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 Married. So are, well, I guess, are you still, uh, and you, some of these maybe are personal, so you don't have to answer all that. But sure. Did, was, what was that just from an emotional standpoint, what mm -hmm. was all that like? If, if you could like kind of mm -hmm. tell it in a way of like, we were like right next to you or something like, what was that? Sure. Like? And then what are, if you're willing to answer, are you still, uh, with her or did that right. not work out due to this scenario? Just right. Curious. Yeah. Uh, no, we got divorced uh, about five years after that uh, story. Um, oh, wow. So yeah. it wasn't that. Yeah. Or, you know, or whatever. No, no, oh, it was not. Uh, that was not the. Uh, so, yeah. OK, so one <laughs> one one difference between the movie and real life, I'll tell you, is that in the movie, they have me uh, lying to my girlfriend at the time you know telling her we're you know you know about about the business and not you know and that she gets really upset that we're doing these arms deals in real life she knew the whole time and i never lied to her i told her you know i'm selling guns i'm selling ammo i'm selling we're also selling fuel and and uh and and clothes and and food and we we're selling all sorts of things to the federal government we weren't just doing arms arms ended up being the vast majority of the money we made but we we're selling all sorts of things to the federal government and I, and I and I was completely open with her and she was totally cool with it. She had no problem with any of it. As long as I was bringing in the money, she was happy. And yeah. and uh, we ended up being married for about five years after this whole uh, story occurred. Uh, eventually, we got divorced, um, been divorced for 11 years now and and happily divorced. <laughs> um, my daughter is uh, 16 years old now. So, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's quite a trip. She was a baby when the, uh, she was born literally a few weeks, uh, after we won the contract. So yeah, yeah. So that's how long it's been. It's been 16 years since we won that contract 2007. Um, yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that was like, I mean, during the lead up to that, I mean, you know, my wife was pregnant and I was working completely on commission. And so I wasn't getting paid a salary. I was living off my savings with a kid on the way. So I was extremely stressed out, uh, extremely stressed out and, uh, extremely motivated to, uh, to make this thing work because it was the only thing I had going for me at the time. So that's why I was working 18 hours hour days on a, you know, for months and months on end, um, uh, because it was, it was that or go bankrupt, uh, you know? So, yeah. So, I guess at last yeah. question, um, is cause you've done, I think you said eight products now. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight on like manufacturing and stuff? Like, is it like Alibaba or mm -hmm. just is because I think that for a lot of people that want to do products, that's one of the most difficult parts, right. Is like finding manufacturing. Mm -hmm that is cost effective and trustworthy mm -hmm. and you know, you've done it eight times now so mm -hmm. you're, you have insight yeah so i will say that it's difficult <laughs> you know <laughs> ma man manufacturing is not easy um and things always go wrong so you just have to prepare yourself for that uh, as far as finding good manufacturers alibaba is actually pretty good i found a few of my manufacturers on alibaba uh if you can if if you have a way to uh, get referrals from people you know, that's even better because then they you know you know people who've already have experience with these particular people, but most people don't. Most people don't know anyone who's doing manufacturing, so uh, they're kind of going into it blind. Uh, I would start with Alibaba. That's a that's and then just find a manufacturer that makes a product that is as close to the product that you want to make. Um, there wow. are, yeah. And, and then you get, you find a few of those don't find just one, right. Find as many as you can and you get them to sign. If you're depending on the product you're making, you know, if it's like a unique design, you'll probably want to get, to get them to sign a non-disclosure agreement, a non-disclosure agreement or NDA for sure is not particularly enforceable. It just makes everyone feel better. Uh, so people do it as kind of like a matter of course, um, but uh, but most companies are in business to do business on you know the right way. Uh, you know they're they're not they're not in business to screw people over, especially if they have a bit of a track record. So 
uh, I would recommend that people, first of all, find a manufacturer that is makes a, a product as close to what you want to make, a business that has been around for at least several years, not a new brand new business. So Alibaba will tell you how old the business is. And that's one good thing about Alibaba. Um, you could also ask the manufacturer for references. Uh, you know, they will, they will usually uh, give you, uh, you know, contact information for some of their customers that you could uh, contact and ask them, you know, how's it been doing business with them? Of course, that's not the the uh, no guarantee because they they'll only give you contact information for people that are happy with them but at least it shows that they can do legitimate business with somebody right um and i would highly recommend that when it comes down to actually manufacturing that once you are doing the first what they call the pilot production run which is a small amount in the beginning to see how it goes that you go to the factory and you stay there until you until um uh it, the first production run is is completed because there will always be issues that you are not that you did not foresee and there is almost always issues that you have to see in person when you're manufacturing a product you can't like pictures over the internet are usually not enough like you need to be able to feel it and to you know jiggle it around and make sure it doesn't fall apart and see how it how it sounds and and smells and you know and tastes so who knows i mean depending on what you're making and so so you need to be there and when you know then you could point out to them i need this and this and this change this is not good you know the manuf the the packaging is not good you know whatever it is and then you have to be there and wait until they fix it and fix it on a consistent basis so i'd highly recommend going there the first time i when i manufactured the beat buddy i ended up, i was planning on going to china for a month i ended up staying there for 3 months because we discovered new issues that had to be fixed and i had to stick around for them to fix it and it would take them a week to fix it and it wouldn't make sense to fly back to the united states just for a week and then come back and you know it's much cheaper to just stay there uh, currently, my brother, the CEO of Instafloss, is in Mexico. He's been there for the last six months because uh, we're do we're doing our first manufacturing of Instafloss at in Guadalajara, and uh, and we encountered all sorts of issues. The Instafloss is actually pretty uh, uh, challenging to manufacture because it has a uh, high water pressure and things like it like that can leak uh it's so it's got 12 water jets uh which is 12 times more than like a standard water pick so we needed a bigger motor which causes more vibration which could loosen the joints and so we have a lot of like problems that we had to fix and so he's been there for six months um but he's actually coming back next week because we finally fixed all the problems um and uh, so that's that was one of the reasons we decided to manufacture in Mexico because it's just so much easier to get to. And with the with the tariffs with that that uh, Trump put in place, it turned out to be more or less about the same price for the Instafloss as manufacturing in China. So it made sense for us to go to Mexico. For our music products, it's there we actually don't have any tariffs on that, so it still makes sense for us to manufacture in China. Um, so yeah, I would highly recommend that anyone doing manufacturing uh go to the factory um if you really want to feel better about it go before you sign a contract and put a deposit just to meet people and see that they're real rather than scammers online which is always a possibility um you know but that depends on your budget whether you could afford to make that trip and depending on where the factory is where you're at um but definitely you have to go for the first manufacturing run i would i would definitely say that yeah Makes sense. Yeah, 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 and and Sorry. yeah. Before we uh, before we end, I do have one other venture that I would like to talk about. Oh yeah, please do. That yeah. Is, that is is brand new. Um, it's has not been launched yet, so I'm uh, giving you a little, uh, giving your listeners a little a little sneak peek. Um, it's so a lot of people over the years, uh, since the movie the War Dogs movie came out, um, have asked me to teach them how to do government contracting and yeah and i you know i mean i i had i was not allowed to do this business for the last 15 years right <laughs> i was banned from doing government contracting but that ban has recently expired um 
And so I partnered with um, with uh, actually these two guys who were inspired by War Dogs to start their own government contracting business. They contacted me like about a year ago and they're like, hey, just want to let you know. Um, because, you know, usually I'm sorry to yeah. go out, out of order here, but usually what happens is I get like a message on like Instagram or Twitter or, you know, an email or something. And it's usually some some guy who's down on his luck and he's like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm willing to put in whatever level of, of work is required. I'm just like you were in the movie when you were down on your luck, you know, I'm willing, you know, just teach me and I'll do all the work and I'll give you a cut. Right. And first of all, I'm not allowed to do that, or at least until recently was not allowed to do that. Um, but second of all, I've got these other businesses. Right. And I'm not really particularly interested in getting back into government contracting. Yeah. But I, uh, so uh, so then I got this uh, email one day from from these two guys and they they said, you know, just wanted you to know we around five years ago, we saw War Dogs and we were so inspired that we decided to, to try giving it a go ourselves. And it took us like a year, but we finally won our first contract in doing laundry services of all things, right? Because the government oh. buys everything. I mean, they buy literally everything. They're the biggest customer in the world, uh, the federal government. So they specialized in laundry services and now they have a multi million dollar government contracting business specializing in laundry services. And they just contacted me saying, Hey, just wanted to let you know that we really appreciate it. It was a very, the movie was very inspirational. I wanted to say thank you. And, you know, I, I, I was like, wow, that's really inspiring that someone act because most people just come to me, say, Hey, you know, teach me everything. And, and, uh, and then I never hear from them again. You know, I mean, I'll give people like a link here. You could, you know, start off by you know, learning a little bit here, but, um, but I, obviously I don't have time to, to sit down and, and mentor every single person who comes my way. So I had the idea, you know, that I, to partner with these guys and start a online course that we're calling War Dogs Academy. I love it. <laughs> Full circle, baby. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it's going to teach. We're going to be very detailed and make it as easily digestible as possible um, to get people uh, up and running and uh, and teach them how to do government contracting. And we're going to, you know, we're going to have War Dogs Boot Camp, which is the initial course. And then we're going to have, you know, the War Dogs Army, which you could join um, for you know, from a reasonable monthly subscription, uh, <laughs> which will give you access to a community and to you can network with people. And we have investors who are interested in funding government contracts uh, who will be part of it. Uh, because one of the biggest challenges doing government contracting is even if you win the contract, you need to pay your supplier, pay the logistics person. And then after you deliver to the government, you need to wait at least 30 days for them to pay you, which means that you need the money to float that right so if you have a if you win a hundred thousand dollar contract to to deliver you know boots or guns or anything to the to the government you need that hundred thousand dollars to pay for the materials and you won't get paid for a few months later um so having access to financing is a huge stumbling block for people who don't have contacts uh now the good thing from an investor's point of view is that a federal contract is one of the safest things to invest in because the federal government always pays its bills so as long as the supplier is reliable and the logistics plan is good which you know since we will be doing a high quality job with War Dogs Academy, we're going to teach people how to do it the right way and not mess up. Uh, we have investors who are very interested in funding these federal contracts. So that's going to be part of the uh, appeal and the sale, sale point of uh, War Dogs Academy is that we're going to teach you how to do it and we're going to give you access to financing and to um, professional services like legal and accounting that you're going to need in order to actually turn it into a real business. And so anyone who's interested in that, uh, it's not up yet. Uh, so it, it there's nowhere to sign up yet. However, if you could follow me on Instagram, uh, at David Packhouse, my name is uh, David, P-A-C-K-O-U-Z. Uh, and I'm going to make an announcement on my Instagram account uh, when we have it up and running, which it will hopefully be in a couple months. 
Dude, that is awesome. Um, yeah. And then one more time before we hop off, what's yeah. the uh, website? So it's uh, Singular Sound and then uh, yeah. Instant Loss. Yes. And yeah, so it's Singular Sound is my music company. Instafloss is the flossing device company. And and anyone who wants to uh, stay in contact and see, you know, the new things I'm launching, like uh, War Dogs Academy, uh, should follow me on Instagram, which is at David Packhouse. Also Twitter, X, as they call it now, uh, yeah. at David Packhouse. Perfect, man. Thank you again for yeah. coming on, man. Really enjoyed it. My pleasure. Thank you.